Well, hello there. How are you? This is me, Ryan. I'm the host of the show. I'm popping in here before the show even starts, which I almost never do, but I figure this episode here with Adam Andra is going to attract a lot of new listeners to this podcast, and I just wanted to take a second to welcome you, if you are new, and also if you're not. Welcome. I hope your climbing and training are going great. I have been struggling a little bit personally, but of course that's very on brand for what we do here at The Struggle. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this conversation with The King, and if you do, I would really appreciate your support by just having you follow the show. In fact, that is something that you can do right now. Just like you can hit that little plus button right there in your podcast player. Go ahead. It feels awesome. Follow the show. And then every week you're going to get a banger episode delivered straight to your ears. I work really, really hard on this show, and I hope it brings some joy to your day and also some benefit to your climbing. So thank you for listening and following with that little plus button right there. Thank you. And all right, let's cue the music and get into it. I like to climb on my limit and it doesn't really matter if it's on the, in the gym or outdoors or on the comp, it's just the same. Every time I start climbing, I just want to climb my best. Hey y'all, I'm Ryan Devlin and welcome to the Struggle Climbing Show, where I talk with elite climbers about their struggles and breakthroughs in training, nutrition, tactics, and mental game, and how we can all level up with help from the pros. Now today we're chalking up for a chat with a real goat, arguably THE goat, talking about the greatest of all time here, Adam Andra. Oh my gosh, I wish I had the three hours that it would take to properly cover Adam's accomplishments on rock and plastic. But the list is just too long, and I want to get to this interview, so let me hit on just a few of the high points here, which is about as high as it gets for our sport today. So, going way back here to age 9, Adam on-sighted his first 7C+, plus or 513A. That's the grade that I'm currently trying to punch into myself. He also ticked his first 9A, or 14D, at just 13 years old. And from there, man, it's been a mind-blowing run of hard repeats, cutting-edge first ascents, insane on-sites, and comp domination. Adam has 18 World Cup gold medals. He's one of the best boulderers in the world with 4 V16, or 8C+, and 17 8C, or V15, sends to his name. Now, I feel like he just doesn't get a lot of attention for bouldering, but he should because he is crazy, crazy accomplished on that. And then on sport where of course he's best known and is the best in the world, Adam has flashed up to 9A+, plus or 515A, with his send of Super Krakenette. He was the first to red point 515C, or 9B+, plus with change in Flatanger, and then again with the first ascent of La Dura Dura in Oleana, and then he was the first to establish the hardest grade in the world at this time with Silence in Flatanger, a 9C, or 515D route, which was a four-year project and has yet to see a repeat. We talk a lot about that, actually, in today's episode. So, he can compete, he can boulder, he can sport climb at the highest level, but what about big walls, you ask? Well, yeah, he can do that too. He nabbed the second ascent of the Dawn Wall, widely considered the hardest big wall route in the world at 514D or 9A, and he did it in impressive style, y'all, leading every one of its 32 pitches and topping out in just eight days. He easily has the most impressive resume in climbing, but honestly, what I think defines Adam more so than just his green check marks is his drive, his passion, his work ethic, and his knowledge. He's sent more than 200 routes that are 9A or harder. 200! Now, with all that experience came a lot of knowledge, and lucky for us, he's ready to drop some of it on us here today. Get ready. All right, just a little update here from my personal world of training and climbing. Man, the weather's been pretty uncooperative for me over here at the Red River Gorge to get back on my 13A project, so I have been hitting the training pretty hard, you guys. And honestly, I, I think I needed the mental break from red pointing because I have been loving my time in the gym lately. I'm doing a lot of limit bouldering. I'm on the moon board a lot, and I'm just really trying to keep my finger strength and my power topped up. And I'm working them hard right now. So the way that I'm supporting my fingers with this higher training load is my favorite finger food around, supercharged collagen by Fizzy Vantage. Y'all, I've been a paying customer of Fizzy Vantage for years now, long before there was even a podcast. And that's because it works. My fingers have never felt stronger or recovered faster, even now as I am working them harder than I ever have before. 
So I'll usually just shake a scoop of the supercharged collagen into my pre-workout before I hit the gym, and then studies show that it's going to help support my tendons to get stronger and recover faster as a result. I cannot recommend it enough. I love it. I love the taste of it and how it's working. And look, I'm just a weekend warrior, but when I see pros like Daniel Woods, Paige Clausen, Jimmy Webb, and Jonathan Segrist, along with more than 50 other top names in climbing using Fizzy Vantage every day, well, I know this stuff is the real deal. Hit that link in your podcast notes or use checkout code STRUGGLE15 to save 15% off any full price nutrition order at fizzyvantage.com if you're in North America. And over in Europe, you can check out the Banana Fingers and Epic TV online shops. Give it a shot. I think you are going to feel the difference. And now speaking of finger training, I did a round of testing recently just to see where my strength and endurance are at after spending so much time on my project this fall. And I'm happy to report y'all that I'm in better shape than I thought that I would be at this point in time. I kind of figured that my top end strength would have gone down since my project is so long and pumpy and it didn't seem like I was working that top end strength. But in fact, it went up a little bit, which was really cool to see. I'm going to share all those results in an upcoming episode. And I'm telling you, it was really easy for me to test and compare with all of my prior tests because I did it all in the crimped app. I've been using the crimped app to program my training for years now. Sometimes I do it on my own as a self-coached climber, and sometimes I utilize their thoughtfully designed plans geared towards sport climbing or bouldering. And I also do all of my assessments in the app, which by the way, is totally free to download. I easily just load up a test. I recently did max hangs, endurance repeaters, and uh, max pull-ups. And then in the profile tab on the app there, you can compare those results to your prior tests. There's also loads of workouts for zero cost with the free version of the app. And then if you want to level up even more and gain access to customized training plans that basically puts a coach in your pocket, you can give Crimped Plus a shot. It's only a handful of bucks a month, and it's really awesome. Like I said, I've been using it for years. I am far more consistent with my training when I'm programming everything in Crimped. So if you need a bit of organization or motivation or variety in your training, I highly recommend you check it out. You can hit that link in your notes or just search Crimped in your app store to download it for free and take your training to new heights. Now, I just want to give a quick shout out here, if I could, to Magnus Mitbo for helping to make this conversation here with Adam happen. I had Magnus and his business partner, Till Gross, on the show recently to chat about their new online climbing course platform called Altitude Climbing. And Adam is just about to release a sport climbing course on that platform. And I got to preview it, and it is in-depth and impressive. It's so well done. We talk uh, a little bit about that in this interview here with Adam, and I'm going to share more about it at the end. But again, I just wanted to take a second to appreciate Magnus and Till for connecting me with Adam, as I've been trying to get him on the show for a long time now. So thank you, Magnus and Till, and congrats on Altitude. And lastly, a big thanks to all of you patrons and subscribers out there. Be sure to check out the bonus episode that I just dropped for you where Adam answers your questions, he geeks out about training, and he shares some stories that I have never heard before. Man, it's really good stuff. If you're not a member of the show, I'm going to tell you more about those perks later. But first, let's power scream our way into this chat with Adam Andra. Is it early where you live in Kentucky? Uh, it's yeah, it's seven thirty in the morning. Uh, the kiddos are just starting to get up and get ready for school. <laughs> they may pop in here and give me a kiss before they run off to school here. But cool. <laughs> my apologies in advance. No problem. You get it. You're a dad. Yep. <laughs> you, you got a pretty little dude though, right? Like what is it? One year, one years old. One year, eight months. Oh, okay. Almost two years. I think you were climbing eight a at two years old. So <laughs> no, not really. But yeah, let's let's dive in here. Um, you know, speaking of the Red River Gorge, uh, it's it's a winter here, of course, so um, the weather isn't great. But you came out here a while back and basically flashed everything. But you also were working on some projects and things. Have have you been back, or are you planning to come back? The reason I never really came back was like all the hard stuff that I bolted or I saw. I could imagine like how friction dependent they are. Like I would say up to. 9A maybe is not so crazy friction dependent, but I think all the projects in Chocolate Factory are crazy friction dependent. I think it's not so easy to find good conditions unless you live there, right? 
Yeah, you really have to be here because we did have a great fall season and start mm -hmm. to the winter season. December was fantastic. It was really dry mm -hmm. and really cold, so it was great. But sometimes you can get some really humid stretches. Yeah. So you kind of have to be able to camp out here for maybe a month or two to get those perfect days. But you did bolt something crazy over at Chocolate Factory that just looks so futuristic. <laughs> Do you think you'll get back to it? I think for sure it's possible. I, I mean, I think the left project is considered to be harder. That one... I tried quite a bit. I couldn't do all the moves, but I was pretty sure I would, if I had tried it for two more days, I could do all the moves. But I just thought, ah, oh, I wish I had it at home because I just thought, okay, you could stay here for a month and, and maybe don't really get, it's like you would definitely get good conditions enough just to try the moves, but it felt like so consistently hard and so much on these like slopey crimps where you can't really stop and choke up which yeah in this case conditions would play the most important role i mean it plays right. the most important role in almost any kind of hard climbing but <laughs> there are some routes where it matters more yeah absolutely well we'd love to have you back whenever you want to come out and, and take a crack at it <laughs> let's dive in let's start where we always like to start here on the show which is struggle and i'd love to understand from you what your relationship with struggle is as a rock climber? Nah, almost always it is frustrating, but I, I think over the years I learned to appreciate it more. And I learned that you don't really succeed unless you struggle enough, or then that success is maybe not so relevant. So I, I'm pretty sure like all the achievements I did in my life were after quite a bit of struggle and maybe some of those achievements that are considered to be like, super good i may not really value so much because i don't think i struggled enough kind of <laughs> so if it's too easy it's not as rewarding yeah yeah like the first thing that comes to my mind i think like even though it sounds weird i'm like really grateful that for my first world championships when i was 16 i came just second just behind bachio soviaga who absolutely deserved it because he was three times silver on the world championships and I made a little mistake, but I think that really ultimately motivated me to train really hard and ultimately get the first world championships title in 2014, actually under Pachi's guidance as a coach, which made it even more cool. I uh, love that. That's great. And I think 18 gold medals between then and now. So maybe that, that second place finish did motivate you to, <laughs> to try that much harder. Do you find yourself then seeking out struggle because it's so apparent in your climbing that you care like you really care and this is something that i spoke with that magnus shared when i was when i had him on the show he said you know maybe adam's biggest superpower is that he just cares so much whether he's getting on a you know a, a cutting edge climb in flatanger or trying to climb a bridge in czech republic you, you care so much about all of that and i'm, I'm curious kind of where that drive and maybe how struggle kind of interplays with how much you do care when you pull onto a climb. So I think every person has a certain like right mixture between success and struggle. I think some people just enjoy maybe sending more when it comes to climbing and struggling less. And if they just struggle more, I think it's just too hard to handle with it. And I don't think I'm a kind of person who is dealing it with it the best. I definitely enjoy sending a lot and from the time to time, it, even if I have a, like a long-term project that I know I have to struggle for a certain amount of time, I know that it's going to take a lot of time. Still, I like to have some kind of side projects to kind of, you know, still remember how it is to kind of send something. <laughs> but about caring that I care really a lot, whether it's a hard project in Fatanger or like a bridge. It's not really about how much I care, but just I like to climb. I like to climb on my limit and it doesn't really matter if it's on the, in the gym or outdoors or on the comp, it's just the same. Every time I start climbing, I just want to climb my best at, at that moment. And I think most importantly, because I love it, you know, people, some, sometimes people say, no, I just climb for fun. But for me, yes, I also, most of the time climb really for a lot of fun and climbing at your limit at your potential doesn't have to be 
not fun at all. Like can be a lot of fun. I mean, sometimes rarely, especially I have a, if I have a long-term project and I think every professional climber knows it at a certain point, yes, it might get annoying. It's not like you lose motivation for climbing, but you lose motivation to like try that single project like for yet another time. And I really love on siding and uh, yeah, staying at one crack, always like doing the same warm up and the same one or two tries in the project sometimes gets really annoying. But it really yeah. depends. I mean, in terms of silence, in case of silence, for example, it never really turned into so much annoyment. In terms of, I don't know, like La Dura Dura, it was quite a lot of struggle. <laughs> well, I'm excited to dive into both of those routes in, in particular as we kind of work through some of our chapters here. Um, but I think that's a great segue for us to kind of shift into uh, a focus on training. And training is something that obviously you've been doing for your entire life. You're doing this course now with altitude that, that incorporates some training, both physical and mental. But I'm curious, just kind of big picture, if there's a specific area of training that has been a struggle for you or that maybe even currently is. In general, and I also say it in the course, over the years since I started climbing, I really focus on the movement, on the technique, on the flow, on like trying to climb the, hard, the hardest possible routes with the least power that I had. And I think even, especially growing up as a kid, even into my like late teenage years, physically, I was really weak. Even now, it really makes me like, it's unbelievable what I was able to climb when I was like 17, 18, considering like I couldn't do anything on campus board or something like this. And that makes me always realize, okay, like, yeah, physical power, undoubtedly, it's super, super important. But most of the time, it's maybe a little less important than people might think. Well, I, I think that's kind of a hot take because so much is made of finger strength in the climbing world. And I'm, I'm curious from your perspective here, mm. do, do you feel finger strength is the most important factor when it comes to climbing well? Or would you categorize it as mm. something else? I don't like like these big statements, like something is the most important. It's obviously very important. Uh, another sure. question is, how do you actually measure finger strength? So me in particular, even now, and especially when I was 15 year old, I would think finger strength, especially when I was 15 year old, was my strength. But if you would measure it by the standards that we usually take it, like two arm dead hang with the most weight that you could take on one arm dead hang, I would be like ridiculously weak. I think if I, when I was 15, like middle beast maker edge on 2000, I don't think I would be able to one, one arm dead hang in. And like now it wow. seems like seven, a climber can do it. I mean, Mostly because I think like it's so much more about the shoulder strength than you think. Uh, and like my shoulders were always like super flexible, super hyper mobile which for certain aspects of climbing is great, but not for one arm dead hangs. But you have to realize that it's almost never that you want arm dead hang on a rock. It's maybe a bit more common in the gym and especially in the modern style of bouldering, but on the rock, you never really have to do it. On the other hand, yes, finger strength is very important, but you, I think more of a finger strength in this like kind of pulling on tiny edges on like, old school bowler problems in the gym, that's what it counts. And that's even when I was 15, I was, I would say still quite strong. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're one of the strongest boulders in the world, having climbed some, some of the hardest problems out there. And it is interesting, the difference between objective finger yeah. strength, like just measuring it versus being able to apply it to the wall. Do you even test your finger strength? Do you specifically train like hangs like that? Or are you training up in various other ways? I train the finger strength more by bouldering itself, by campusing, by campus bouldering and stuff like this. I occasionally might do dead hangs a little bit. For me personally, I know that it works really well as a test. That if I feel good on one hour dead hangs, it feels, it means like, okay, I'm strong at the moment, but I don't really do so much training by the dead hangs. But as a measurement, especially, I don't know, as a warm up on a really good day, if I do like one or two dead hangs, it makes me feel like, okay, today is a good day. And that usually never really disappoints. So I think one arm dead hang is very good 
personal reference. But on the other hand, I know that somebody can dead hang 30 kilos plus, which I can't even think about it. And still, if we measure ourselves on the wall, you would never think that I'm weaker or something like this. Yeah, the application of that strength to the wall, and we'll get into that in just a little bit with regard to technique and some tactics, obviously that makes a much bigger difference. We're not just doing mm -hmm. a strongman competition here on how much we can hang. We're trying to apply it to movement over a 3D terrain. So I'm excited to dive into that, but still kind of staying on training for a second here. Mm -hmm. When you reflect back, because you've been a climber now for oh, 25 years or something mm -hmm. like that, and you've been training with some of the world's best coaches and also uh, climbing with some of the world's best climbers. Mm -hmm. When you reflect on those last couple decades, does anything stand out to you with regard to your own training, like a mistake that you made looking back, you know, mm -hmm. something that you would have changed or uh, conversely something that really made the difference? Yeah. I think over the last two years, I really understood how efficient training tool is board climbing and it, uh -huh. Yeah, it can be moonboard, can be culture but most importantly, I think maybe just a board that you do like that, where you only use like a very tiny feet and mostly just wooden edges. That was something that I didn't have on, in my training gym where I usually train. And I always think like, and I was always thinking like, that's something that could be very useful, but I don't really want to waste my technique, but. I could also think of maybe a few climbers that I knew about that they were climbing a lot on the boards like this, and I could easily see how much it transfers into their climbing. Like they were really strong, but they just didn't know how to climb in a way. Like they, they, were, they are really climbing like so frontal. And uh, so I was always really afraid that it would ruin my technique. So it took me like really years to kind of give it a chance. Uh, but I must say that even though I did a lot of campus board in my life, I thought like after some years of campus board training, I kind of got a, to a certain plateau and I never really improved so much. I mean, even because, even though I have maybe like four different campus boards where I train all over the town where I live in Brno, you only have like a limited amount of moves that you can do on campus board, no matter how different edges you have and no matter how wide you do it. It's still kind of the same. You learn that particular move and then it's kind of the same. Whereas like board climbing, yeah, definitely got me recently. And I don't feel like I lost that much technique and I got stronger quicker than I expected. I think like physically I'm the strongest at the moment. And I think mostly to doing more board climbing in the least recent years, because most of the years I've or like since I started train climbing, I basically only trained on the train on the spray wall, which 20 years ago was something that looked like a moonboard, sure. maybe maybe a bit nicer holes, but mostly just tiny edges, and we would just be climbing there all the time. We didn't really have that many lead walls or something like this. And over the years, I think it got some more volumes. It got some more modern holes. But, and I always thought like, yeah, this is the perfect way because you're training technique and power at the same time, which for example, in the course, I would still recommend to average climbers or whoever you want to call them. But board climbing is something very efficient, but I think it's, it's really good for me as I have a long training history and I am quite confident that I don't really lose the technique when, when I start climbing under in real life. So just to give an example, I think it's really important when you have a big foothold to take advantage of it and <laughs> to not really use it as a tiny foothold as on the board. And if yeah. you really want to take the full advantage of a big foothold, you have to climb on a climbs where there are big footholds. Right. I think rather more is quite typical that, yeah, sometimes even in the middle of the overhang, there are really good footholds and you have to be able to take the full advantage and take some weight off your arms. Yeah, we're spoiled out here at the Red. Anytime I go somewhere else, if I climb on granite or limestone, yeah. I, my feet are always scumming off of things and sliding off of things. So everything's kind of a jug 
out here, at least for me at the grade that I'm climbing. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious for you, how, how many days a week are you training on a board? So I usually train three days, one day off, and it's either the almost every time the first day, but it depends whether I'm training half an hour on a board or two hours on the board, and sometimes right. also the second day, which second day it will would involve some kind of tr uh, interval bouldering on it. And I'm playing a lot with the breaks that you do in between the boulders. Sometimes I climb, I don't know, three boulders in, uh, in a row and longer rest. Sometimes I climb pretty hard one, maybe a half a minute rest, repeat four times. I'm playing with that a lot. Yeah. Have you noticed that you require more rest now as you're, you know, into your third decade here compared to maybe 10 mm -hmm. years ago? I would say in a training period, it's quite similar. It is different when I'm like, I'm in the peak. I can definitely notice that day number one, I'm at my best. And day number two, unless the day number two is rest day, I feel like it's not as good anymore. It's hard to tell whether it's maybe a different structure of the training, thanks to which I can be even better on day number one after the rest day, or it's the age, but I would say it's a bit of both. Let me give an example. If there is like a two-day World Cup in lead, the next day, now being 30, I feel like I can climb, but I'm pretty sure I'm not at my best. Um, when I was 16, the very next morning after the World Cup, I would be climbing at the crack and feeling like, wow, I'm feeling so good. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's the best. Yeah. It's a bit frustrating for sure. But you, as you said, you're, you feel like physically you're at your strongest you've ever been but you require a little bit more recovery, a little yeah. bit more rest. And I think that's yeah. typical for, you know, I had a conversation with Chris Sharma not too long ago and he had just climbed Sleeping Lion and you know, he said he requires more rest now, but he's still out there pulling, he thinks as hard as he's ever mm -hmm. been able to. So that's encouraging for old guys like myself. Um, what about sleep? How many hours of sleep are you trying to get a night? Eight hours. Yeah, I know I okay. can't really get more even if I wanted to. I'm kind of guy that, mm, when I feel I had enough sleep, I just wake up, even though it might be quite early in the morning. And then do you do anything else for recovery? Do you do ice baths or sauna or anything like that? Yeah, sauna, massages. Yeah, try to take all the available techniques that I have. have. But let me give an example. For example, sauna, I never take more than once a week. Okay. Getting like multiple saunas a week, even though it's quite easy for me because I have a sauna at home. I feel like it makes me more tired. You jumping into the rivers out there, the cold rivers, or, or hopping into an ice plunge every, every once in a while? Uh, the river is kind of far away from our house, so just ice bath. <laughs> yeah, man, well, this is a good segue, I think, into the nutrition chapter. And we're talking about recovery. We're talking about trying to perform at our best. When you look back, is there any area of nutrition that's been a struggle for you? I don't think so. I've tried quite a few things over the years, but I think eating a bit of everything, caring about the quality of the food probably turns out to be something that I, that works the best for me. When we talk about more like dietary extremes, I also found like it's too mentally difficult to maybe stick to it. And I think none of the maybe more dietary extremes are maybe working in the long term. Hmm. Let me give you an example. First, for example, one week before a competition, I'm vegan and it works really well for me. I feel like lighter and... So you do that just one week before a comp, you go vegan? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not a big meat eater. I might eat like three times a week, four times a week, maybe hundred grams of meat. I feel that is something that I need. If I did on some of the trips, maybe two, three, three weeks vegetarian or maybe even vegan. But I, then I felt like I'm kind of, my body is missing something. I was like more tired than I would expect. And I think that's a good combination. So what does a typical kind of fueling stage look like for you? Like, what are you focusing on in order to make sure that you're recovering the best? You've got the energy that you need to either mm. compete or go send. Depends. I, I really try to have the routine of the meals during the day, no matter what is happening. So I, I don't skip a lunch, even at the crag. I think most of the people like eat breakfast and dinner and just eat some snacks in between. I would always have some lunch at the crag and 
I have an advantage that even if I have a relatively big lunch, I can give it a try half an hour later. I don't really feel heavy wow. or anything after a meal. So like breakfast, lunch and dinner, I try to have like a complex meal with a bit of everything that has around 20 grams of proteins and, uh, and a bit of everything for everything else. And in between, I have some snacks um, and it's not that important what I really eat. If I'm at the crack, it's usually just something sweet and nuts and, and stuff like this. What about anything else that you add in? Do you supplement? What's the, give me, give me the mad scientist Adam Andra routine on how you're the strongest you've ever been now at nearly 31. Not so much. Vitamin C, zinc, depends on the season. During some season, I take something more, but no like artificial supplements that maybe most of the people make. I tried a bit. I never really noticed that my that much difference. I mean, it's really difficult to measure, but you you can never really compare the same amount of training during the same period of time. Um, yeah, so sure. I think it's more important to really focus on like the ver variety of the food and be making sure that you have enough. And for me, for example, the, the timing of the food is almost more important. So I definitely noticed that I, I really try to finish the training around six, six thirty, have dinner at seven and then just fast until the morning. So to have at least 12 hours where you don't really consume anything that I think that for me works really well. I appreciate you sharing that. What's your favorite meal? What's your kind of your go-to food? What brings you joy? It's strange, but really it's something that I don't consider healthy. I don't even like, like so much. So. The way that we are cooking is like really simple. We think like, okay, what source of protein we are having today? What source of carbs we are having and what kind of vegetables we are making? And then we just mix it somehow together. And it's very rare that it doesn't work. So for example, now it's winter season. So I don't know, baked pumpkin or baked red beets is one of our favorites. We Even our son Hugo loves it. So it's probably one of our common things that we eat. What about caffeine, either for performance or just in your life and alcohol? Yeah, I drink quite a lot of black tea and maybe one or two cups of coffee a day. And yeah, I think it's especially mentally having a bit of coffee just before I go climbing helps me. It's hard to quantify like how much it's mental, but I so sort of developed a kind of routine. But I went through a certain stages with the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I was like trying not to have coffee at all or trying to limit it maybe once or twice a week. But in the end, I'm thinking like, I have never really noticed that much difference. And I enjoy the taste of the coffee, so I stick to it. What about alcohol? Do you restrict alcohol or do you enjoy a beer every once in a while? So when I'm training hard, I never really get any alcohol. Maybe like during the rest day, if there is like a family celebration, yes, I might get one glass of wine. It's like, I like the taste of alcohol. If I'm on the trip outdoors, that means I'm actually not doing so much volume of train of climbing. When you want to send something hard, paradoxically, that's the time when I don't think it's important so much, whether you get that one glass of wine or one, one beer or not. But if I'm training really hard, I definitely notice it a lot. Yeah, well, sometimes it's good for the mental side of things just to relax, especially if you're in, you're in Spain. That That's like basically in all of the climbing, maybe there are certain ways that are like the most perfect that you could do. But you have to also ask yourself, like, is it worth it for me? Is it maybe going to only make like more pressure when you actually want to send something? <laughs> so right. I think it's about finding the balance in all of your life and deciding like what's worth it or not. All right, y'all, just a quick breather here to talk about every climber's favorite topic, finger strength and a better way to build it. Are you guys working on your fingers? Well, I have been, both endurance and top end strength. And I'm telling you, I've been blown away by the results as I have been training on the force board by pitch six. Now, if you're not familiar with what a force gauge is, let me tell you about it for a second here because I'm telling you, it is changing the game when it comes to finger training. So you know how with like a traditional hangboard, you're hanging from your fingers and then you're trying to figure out how much weight to either add or take off with plates and pulleys and all that stuff to dial in the load that you want? 
Well, the force board is just a better way to do things. It's this digital gauge that you either pull down on, like if you hang it over your head, or you pull up from, from on the ground. That's what I usually do. And it measures the exact force that you're putting out. So like, if you wanna do max finger hangs, there's a protocol for that. And it'll measure exactly where you're at on that day and on each hand. So check this out. I discovered that my left hand is actually a little bit stronger than my right hand right now. So I'm able to precisely dial in my finger training accordingly using the force board. I'm also training up my endurance with their repeater protocols, which are so rad. And all of my results are stored right there in the app, which is fantastic. It's really well designed. And I can even see where I stack up with my training against others in the community for a little extra insight and motivation and like gamification. It's really fun. The force board gauge is very small. It's like the size of my wallet. So I bring it with me to the crag and to the gym to do my warm ups. And then also when I travel, so I can get my training in on the road. And because you don't need to mess around with hanging heavy weights, it is far safer on your shoulders and your elbows. You basically just get to isolate your finger flexor muscles. So the training is highly targeted, effective, and it also results in faster recovery. This is all really well documented stuff. So look, if you're serious about training, I cannot recommend this tool enough. It's cheaper than a pair of climbing shoes and it will totally change how you train your fingers. You can see it in action over at thestruggleclimbingshow.com slash forceboard. And that link, which is also in your show notes, will automatically give you 10% off your order, plus it supports the show. I'm really psyched for this partnership. You can learn more at thestruggleclimbingshow.com slash forceboard. This episode is also made possible by patrons and subscribers of the show. Thank you all so much. For about the price of a beer each month, you get all sorts of perks, and I work really hard on them. I'm talking about 40 hours of exclusive content with the likes of Chris Sharma, Hazel Finley, Adam Andra, Alex Honnold, Nina Williams, Allison Vest, Ravioli Biceps, Tom Randall, and so many more. Plus, that support from you is honestly what helps me to keep putting together thoughtful interviews with banger guests like the one you are currently listening to. So if you would be willing to buy me a beer, pop over to patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show and check things out. And if you're an iPhone person, you can subscribe right there in your Apple podcast player. And there's a free trial going on at both of those right now, actually. So you can sign up for free and just see if this is something that's bringing value to your life and to your climbing. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. All right, let's get back to the conversation. It'll take us into the tactics chapter here. And you're a tactical master. There's any number of ways we could take this part of the conversation. I've got some notes here. But you mentioned at the start of this conversation, La Dura Dura. Mm -hmm. And that was a heck of a project at the time, the hardest in the world, something that you put a lot of work in on. And I'm curious, on that one, I've heard you in interviews, how projecting at that level can stop being fun when that progression stops. And we, you know, touched on that kind of at the beginning here. That's relatable for all of us, okay? I'm working on my first 7C plus right now. I was making great progression, and now I keep falling two moves from the chains at the red point crux, and I'm finding it a little bit less enjoyable. You know, I wouldn't say it's a drag yet because I'm still psyched on the project, but I'm not making the progression from session to session like I was. Dura yeah. Dura is you know, a good example of that. So I'm curious how you break through that rut. Yeah. So what for me actually helped in case of La Dura Dura is that it's not my home crack and I had to make multiple trips. In general, I think over the two or three weeks of working on a project, you get it really dialed. You should feel like a really good flow in the body. And yes, you can still make some little tweaks. You can still find slightly better beta uh, or something like this even after months of trying, but there's not that much efficiency, which will improve after two or three weeks. For me, it's really after two weeks. And if I feel that I'm still relatively far from sending for me, that is conclusion. Okay. I have to come back and I have to come back with better shape or maybe at least better prepared for this particular piece of climbing, which Sure. Is I think most people would maybe think like, because the progression usually w w between day number one and one week or two weeks is like really wow. From all of a sudden something like is impossible. You can't do the moves. All of a sudden it's suddenly coming together really well. 
But then I think it's quite normal that the progression stops. And I think if people work on a project for like years, I think the explanation that is that they end up sending it mostly because they just improved in the meantime, not because they really learned the project like much better or anything like that. So for me, it's like every time I went for the Red Rai, I just found out, okay, I wasn't good enough. Okay, I wasn't good enough. Then so there was one trip, I think trip number three. I thought like, nah, maybe I'm good enough. I'm, I just didn't have enough days. Uh, it was April and it was kind of getting warm. So I came back, thought I would do it. Um, but I actually thought, found out, no, I wasn't strong enough. Then trained. For another month and then i came back and like from day number one that trip i just knew i was gonna do it so tactically speaking when you are whether it's la dura dura or another route that that you've done and taking this into kind of what could be applicable to me and folks that are listening if we continue to get stopped at a certain spot a certain move maybe or a certain sequence is there something that you would recommend or that you do yourself to try to break out of that Oh, this is where I fall. You know, that kind of rut that you can get yeah. into where you just, you, you climb to the same spot and then you fall. So even if you're projecting something for months, don't ever stop thinking about different betas. When you're like, after you fall off, go and inspect. Sometimes like there is something and it's actually quite often that even like a few days before I send some multi-week project, I discover like one tiny little thing that helps me because climbing is so much about the details and something you know the margin between falling off the crux and finally sticking it is really really small uh so if you keep following the same move and you really tried your best to find different beta there is not and when we are talking about a beta, it's not like you are going to use a different handhold. You, it's also could be about, I don't know, like the timing of the move is a little bit different. The body position is a little bit different. There is like a lot of different things that you could do. But you should also ask yourself, what can you do to get fresher up there? And again, could be maybe slower down. There are some moves that you never really bothered like trying so much because you think like, ah, if I want to climb my 8A, uh, those moves are like 6C. They are too easy to actually matter. But sometimes like those right. easy moves matter a lot because maybe those are those few moments where you lose a bit of power and you get to the crux just a bit too tired. Uh, it's also different pacing. In general, I would say if the effort is like really long and relatively low intensity, it makes sense to kind of intentionally climb kind of slow. But if the intensity is higher, it's better to climb faster, but always, you know, not being too tense. If you say to many people climb faster, they just get really tense and just try to climb like robots. Climbing fast and at the same time being relaxed is really difficult. And then it's also like consider the time that you spent in the rests. So sometimes like you get to a good rest after having done a bit of climbing that doesn't make you super tired. My strategy is usually in that rest, especially if there is like a bouldery crux right above, it feels better for me not to spend there too much time. Even if I might feel like a little bit of pump, I feel like hanging for a long time in the jug gets like my, my forearms are like soft. They feel fresh, but they don't have this power. If I only shake out a little bit and then continue, I feel like they have more power to do like a really hard moves. But on the other hand, if it's like a quite a long effort before there is a good rest and then above is just again like really pumpy no hard moves then it makes sense to spend there more time in the rest yeah i mean you're just got a reputation for and have earned it for climbing very fast very efficient it's really impressive to watch how decisive you are whether it's an on-site or flash attempt or just you know a route that you've been working on for quite some time you mentioned 
that climbing fast, oftentimes people will tense up and climb more like a robot. So that could be counterproductive. You've got a whole pacing chapter in this altitude course that I watched, which is just fascinating. I mean, the amount of chapters that are in this course is really impressive. I mean, you really are able to drill down on very specific items. Pacing seems like one can kind of be this thing that unlocks new grades for people. Certainly mm -hmm. for me, I tend to climb pretty slow. And just hearing you talk about that for a second has sparked a lot of ideas. Is there a drill or some way to practice climbing fast, but relaxed? It's true that for most of the people, if they climb just a little bit faster, I would say it will work better for them. But I think finding the right pace for you, like individually, it's just a matter of a lot of practice and like trying to really experiment with different pacing. Ideally, if you have a project or I don't know, you are training on the lead well that doesn't really reset the routes very often, you're really forced to train on just a few routes, then I think you really find out what kind of pace works the best for you. I think also a good way to get better in climbing fast is interval bouldering. So just pick one bold problem that uh, you try to climb maybe three, four times in a row, depending if it's a hard one, then you maybe take even one or two minute rest in between. If it's maybe like a sub, sub maximal bold round, maybe you, you climb it three or four times. And it can be a bold round in a commercial gym. It can be bold round on a kilt board or moon board. It doesn't matter. I think there the learning curve of like being efficient is much higher or much faster because you are climbing it just back to back as opposed to project outdoors where you try three tries a day with like one hour break and then maybe in the next weekend again. So I think the learning right. curve in terms of movement is never really as fast as doing interval bouldering in the gym. And I think that's the most eye opening is like something that feels really hard at the beginning. You can barely climb it as a single ball brown during a bouldering session. Maybe you come back next time, you climb it a few times in a bouldering session, and then you come next time and it feels easy. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. I think that's so great. It might take you a minute the first time you do it, and then you're, you've whittled it down to 20 seconds after that because you just know exactly where you're going, the position. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you can learn in that sense. In terms of all problem, it could be like it comes from 20 seconds to eight seconds in the end. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love it. That's great. Okay. Well, speaking of boulders, before we shift to the mental game chapter here, but speaking of bouldering, you're, you're one of the top boulders in the world. Uh, and there's a very different amount of kind of tension and try hard and grr that, that needs, you know, often to go into a boulder problem than a sport route. I personally struggle with this because I'm a route climber. So I tend to try to climb everything very relaxed. So then mm -hmm. it's really hard for me to kind of flip into like grr mode, you know, when a boulder yeah. problem either on the route or just if I go bouldering comes up and you seem to be able to flip that switch really yeah. well. And I'm curious what you do in order to go from kind of that relaxed efficiency mode into like you know, let's go mode. I think you have to do it like consciously. So especially if you already know the project, you have already tried the route, so you know where the cruxes are. So I think climbing relaxed where it's possible to climb relaxed is very important. And I think most of the boulders, when they go sport climbing, they face the opposite problem. They are just making the same effort on like easy part as the hard parts, and then they just pump out. But usually on the rock, you always have some kind of little rest. I think especially on in the Red River Gorge, there are always like these horizontal breaks that after a couple of meters, there's always something where you maybe at least do once or twice like this, and then you continue. And for example, the trick for me that I also do is like I change the way that I'm briefing, for example. Mm. So when it's easy, and when I'm climbing, I'm either just trying to breathe more like just almost as breathing normally. If it gets more intense, I trust deliberately try to breathe like more deeper. 
And then when I got to the rest, maybe I just tried to slow down with the breath all the way um, until I'm breathing normally. But then just before I set off, maybe I just tried to breathe again really deeply, like... And for me, that is, for example, the mental trick to tell my body, hey, something is going on. Switch from the resting mode to the fight mode. You have to be mentally ready to fight. So sometimes, you know, you have a jug, you know you're going to be there for like one minute. And for the first half a minute, I'm just like focusing on the resting. And then for another half a minute, it's more like also I'm trying to catch the moment. You know, there is like one moment when you know like, okay, this is like the right amount of time that I should be in the jug. And like everything is like getting ready that in a few seconds you're going to set off and you're going to give it your best. Let's explore the other sides of the mental game in rock climbing. And has there been an area there that's been a struggle for you? For sure. When, when there is a non-important competition, for example, it's not very difficult for me to deal with it. The more important and the harder you are training for a competition, the harder it is to really give your best. And I think especially the way I'm climbing, you know, there are certain things that some people would maybe not even consider as a mistake. And I am considering it as a big mistake. So, <laughs> you know, just a, like a one second hesitation on an onside route on the competition. For me, that's like, oof, I should never do that. And for some people, yeah, that's normal. That's the way they are climbing. Can you be hard on yourself then in, in those scenarios? Yeah. But at the same time, I know that if I want to climb my best on the competition, I just have to take a certain amount of risk. Uh, wow. And I know that I can't really ever beat others if I like try to play it safe. Well, a lot of the pros that I talk with on this show um, struggle with a fear of failure because your career and your identity and these kinds of things are wrapped up in your performance, uh, much more so than I think an amateur climber, although we struggle with fear of failure ourselves as well. Yeah. We set our hearts on a project and we go out with our friends and we want to do it. So it, it is a universal thing, but maybe, you know, yeah. at a more high level for, for somebody like yourself, how do you deal with that fear of failure? I think most often the approach is like, I just try to prepare myself as good as possible. So knowing that I did everything right in the training, in the recovery, and I'm feeling really good and just having this maybe dialogue between me of like just trying to convince myself that everything is perfect and there is no reason why it should go wrong. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like, especially also like during the day, during my warm up, I always try to like pick a certain things that all even like boost that confidence. So I don't know, Wait, like what? during the warm up, like also trying to feel like this scrimper just feels like a jug today. Sometimes you can also like trick your mind. You just have to find something that you believe 100%, even though it might not really be true. Do you listen to music or meditate uh, in order to, to try to get into that perfect mental state? I don't have a routine. Sometimes yes, but most, most often not. For example, in terms of competition, I think it's good to like try to pick all these little things during the warm up and like the, to make sure that you're feeling really fresh. But other than that, you always try to, you almost try to pretend that it's not a comp. It's just like meeting your friends and then only like five minutes before you actually start climbing, you switch the focus completely. And is that similar to when you're about to pull on to uh, what could be a, a very impressive on-site or flash, yeah, so, something of which you've had a lot of success with. Yeah, for me, the pressure on the comp or on a very important project or a route is the same. I don't really see much of a difference. I don't, I don't find it any easier on the rock, actually. Potentially, it could be sometimes even harder when you have a project and you have some kind of nightmare moves, maybe. For me, mentally, it's almost sometimes easier to on-site because you don't really know what to expect. But if you have a project and you know that there is this section where you have to climb as relaxed as possible, but the probability that you're going to slip if you try to go relaxed is really high. And you know how much you want to play it safe or not. It's, it's hard. So for example, yeah. like 
Project Big has a lot of, or BIG now has a lot of sections like this, which are like really easy, but you can slip off them really easily if you just want to climb them as efficiently as possible. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm curious what your perspective is on kind of unfinished business. And, you know, Perfecto Mundo was a series of videos you put out where you really put the process and the struggle of, of that project on display. Uh, BIG, uh, something that is very condition dependent. Obviously, Jakob did a great job of, of being able to pull that together um, and, and you've gotten quite close on it. So whether it's Perfecto Mundo or BIG or, or another, how, how do you feel about unfinished business and can a climb be successful even if you don't get the send? Yeah, it's frustrating, but both of these routes are just momentarily unfinished. I know that sooner or later I will just do them. <laughs> Whereas, I don't know, an unfinished business on Excalibur, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I know that I'm probably never going to do it. So <laughs> I think like EIG, I, there's, that's something that I want really hard and hopefully I will do it this year. On Perfecto Mundo, I know that it's, it's also just so much about conditions and it's like staying there weeks and failing on it is something that is not very tempting to me. On the other hand, I think there is also another approach how I can do the route. That means like I can stay multiple months, maybe in an area nearby, climb on something that I enjoy and only when the conditions are perfect, just to go for it and give it a try. The good news about Perfecto Mundo is like you don't need it that dialed. That like compared to most of the other hard routes in the world, the moves are so simple and basic that it only takes a few tries to like get into it and to feel like your flow is 100%. So you're likely to get back to BIG, it sounds like, this year. Maybe Perfecto Mundo, but not likely Excalibur. Yeah, exactly. Well, great. We'll be paying attention to uh, your YouTube and Instagram to see how those updates come in. I want to talk about something that a lot of us average climbers might wrestle with, which is a fear of falling and how it pertains to some of the climbing that you've done. So you basically dominated every style of, of climbing out there from big wall, sport, boulder, trad, some pretty heady trad, but you haven't taken on free soloing. And why is that? <laughs> I don't want to take unnecessary risk. So I think for sure I climb some routes that are objectively dangerous. I would say the most dangerous routes that I've done in my life are on the Czech Sandstone. Maybe some of you have seen the, uh, the video that we did together with Pete Whittaker and Will Bosey. Yes. Yeah, terrifying. There are some definitely very dangerous sections. The, re the difference for me is that if you free solo, every single second you are in fatal danger. If you are climbing on the Czech Sandstone, it's maybe a few seconds that where you know you know you shouldn't fall, but for the rest of the route you are fall you are fine. So the probability of falling off to your death is much lower. So even if it's a, a rated R trad climb that's run out and the placements aren't good, and I had a conversation with Dave McLeod about this as well, it's just the, there's still the opportunity that a piece will catch you, even if it's a pretty junky placement. Yeah, but as I started climbing, I don't really have so much experience in trad. In, in terms of like placing the gear, I have more experience in trad climbing, which feels more like sport climbing. If, for example, in Dan Creek, I never, I didn't have any fear in Indian Creek. I felt like all the routes that I did is like, wherever you want to place the gear was there, but more kind of UK sketchy tread climbing. Most of it looks like an unnecessary danger for me. <laughs> like the climbing looks relatively easy, just very sketchy. And I think most, most probably if you top rope it, it feels okay. And it's then you just head point it and then give it a try almost as, as if it was a free solo. So tread climbing, I'm much more attracted if it is a route that it's hard, but you can still and go and try to go for an onside and you know that most likely you'll be fine. Even though you might be falling 20, 25 meters, those are the routes that are really attractive. 
for me. And those also are also the routes that I did since I was a little kid. Even at our sport crack, which is pretty run out, or on the Czech sandstone where you have a bolt, but they are really far apart. And maybe like the video that we shot together with Pete Whitaker, that's like the most traditional place. But there are other places which are more... The local climbers would say that they are sport climbing, but they are not, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are some routes which in the red, they would have 20 bolts. In that crack, they might have like five and they're considered overbolt. Well, yeah. for, for me, growing up there, it's completely fine. But I can imagine that if you all, all, the only thing that you know is like sport climbing or sport climbing in a proper sport climbing area, it's like really terrifying. <laughs> but I think right. I'm actually really glad that I was born in Czech Republic where I had a lot of approach to climbs like this. And I think ultimately, I don't know, climbing in Yosemite, it helped me so much to like climb five meters above the last piece and be completely fine about it. And ultimately also, I don't know, sport climbing, because I don't mind skipping the quick draws if I think it's safe. It's just yeah. literally makes no influence on me. When you look back on, on your climbing career here, is there a, a moment that stands out as the most scared you've been on a route? Hmm, not like one particular, like I had one tread climbing experience in Norway, which looking back, I thought like, no, I shouldn't have done it. That, that is more like, I think some experiences is that some people had when they wanted to free solo something, they did it, but it just felt wrong. So I think I was like 17 and it was like my second tread climb ever. It was first ascent. I had literally no idea how to place camps and nuts and i was there belaying by other friends that were in the same situation so i would say that was the one i eventually did it but i spent like one hour on the route got like ultimately pumped and it wasn't good experience <laughs> yeah looking back you did you recognize like the, the placements weren't good or was it while you were on the route itself probably they were not good yeah <laughs> right yeah <laughs> well, you mentioned Yosemite there and, you know, one of your most impressive accomplishments on a long list of impressive accomplishments is the Dawn Wall and leading every pitch of that you did it in eight days. I'd love to hear about that experience, but I'm also curious if you've got plans or dreams to put up cutting edge big walls like the Dawn Wall. Obviously, Tommy and, and Kevin worked for many years on that. It's a lot of work to do something like that, but with as many cutting edge first ascents that you have on sport are, are big walls in your sights as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe in a few years. And I would like to start more with like a shorter multi pitches, basically bringing maybe nine, eight plus nine B's up to the bigger walls, maybe six, 10 pitches in the Alps. But I think it's really important for me to like open these routes ground up with like at least some runouts and do it in a good style, not like make it a sport climb on on a bigger wall and then later on yes i can imagine myself climbing in some more serious environment thinking of yosemite it would be cool to establish something on el cab but what i don't really like is that it's so regulated and basically in almost all the sections of the el cab there are some a lines already and if we think if we were talking about the purity of style that you could like climb the dawn wall, for sure there would be, you could climb in in much better way if you were allowed to bolt in some of the eight climbing pitches. So for example, like the way most of the like uh, laybacking pitches lower down, which are usually around 14A, 13D, that they are mostly just fixed beaks that are just left there, which to me, if you leave them, it's not like the most aesthetical thing. And they, it would be just so much bolder if like instead of having 15 fixed beaks on 40 meter pitch, you would have like just four bolts and that's it. Right. Which, which would be just so bad loss, but you just can't do it. <laughs> We're going through a pretty uh, tense period here with, uh, with regard to bolting and, um, you know, U.S., national park land and this kind of thing. So I would say that the jury's still out on fixed gear and the fixed gear initiative and these kinds of things right mm -hmm. now. But, you know, the bigger point here being that you think there's a 9B multi-pitch or big wall out there that that is ready to be 
worked on. And that I think is incredibly exciting. Obviously yeah. it'll take a ton of work, but when do you think you might tackle that? Relatively soon, you know? I think climbing a 9B on a, on a wall like El Capitan, that's maybe really difficult, but climbing a 9B on a wall that's maybe 200, 300 meters, that's easier. I, I think what is much harder compared to sport climbing is to find a line that will be so difficult, but also will be like very logical, you know, that you will not make like a one contrived pitches, one contrived 9B pitch in the middle of a big wall. So finding a hard route in sport climbing is really easy. It's so much easier than most people think. You can find a 9B, 9C in almost everywhere. Of course, we are talking about like, yeah, some people, some routes are like just, wow, you look at it and you want to climb it. Some people, some routes are maybe, mm, it's okay. But finding a hard multi-pitch route is much more difficult. Yeah. What about 9C plus? What about 10A? Are those routes out there? Have you been on them? Maybe yes, maybe not. I don't know. There are a few projects that I couldn't really do the moves. I can imagine that somebody might be able to do them one day. But if you can't really do the moves, you don't really know about the potential grade. Right. I don't think it's difficult to find a 9C plus or 10A, but you just need to have a level to do it, which I think at the moment, nobody has the level to climb the 9C plus. Yeah. Oh man. But that doesn't mean that Honestly, I don't think I will ever climb the AC plus. I would love to, but I just don't think I will ever have the level. Why is that? Are you going to be focusing on other, other objectives? No, absolutely. If I felt like there is a chance to climb a 9C plus, uh, I would give it everything, but we'll see. <laughs> I just don't think I have because <laughs> like just the 9C is just so much on the limit for me. I'll be happy if I will climb a few more 9Cs that ha that are like different styles and stuff like this, that would be great. Yeah. But 9C plus, if we want to try to be, if we want to stick to the current grading has to be like much harder, subjectively much harder than the 9C. Right. And I think if, you know, if you have the level to climb a 9C plus, you should be able to climb 9C in like a week or max oh two. Oh my gosh. And I'm definitely not able to do that. <laughs> so who's it going to be? Is it going to be one of these comp kids who are coming up? Let's see if they actually rock climb in the future. <laughs> I want to talk about projects that you're working on outside of your own personal climbing. We've got the altitude course, which I've previewed, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic. So I want to hear about what that process has been like for you and maybe what it has taught you beyond what you're going to be teaching mm -hmm. the world who will be taking this, you know, what have you learned putting your coaching hat on? So it was great to work on the course. It was a lot of work for the preparation. We spent a lot of time on the phone call with Katrin, the lady that I was preparing the outline with, but then even the filming was difficult. It was like very satisfying work. I think it helps me to, even for my own climbing, there are so many things that you do over the years, like automatically, subconsciously, but being able to explain it, I think can potentially help me as well in my own climbing, because you have to put it into words and sentences and right. that can be valuable and also makes you reflect that everything that you do in your climbing is maybe it, is it like the best possible way that you can do it? Isn't there something that you're missing? And there are certain techniques that I'm still learning. I'm pretty sure about it. That I think some things just come really natural for me. Uh, also, since I was a little kid, I always focused so much on technique and so much thinking about how you should climb the certain things. Uh, I spent just so much time, you know, going through the sequences of so many different routes and trying to visualize, oh, should you like twist your body like this or like this? Um, but still, I think, especially some aspects of modern bouldering, I think they don't really come so naturally for me. If you asked me 15 years ago, if I would do this course, I would probably say, no, probably not. Because I was thinking, no, when it comes to climbing technique, you, sh you have to find your own. 
you have to find what is the most efficient way of climbing. You have to find like how to, I don't know, heel hook, because then if you find it yourself, it's like deeply ingrained in you. But over the years, I, I realized that everybody has different talents and somebody, no matter how much, how hard he's trying to find the best technique, he will never find it. Right. Because like the level of the perception is different. But if you tell him or her how to do it, they improve immediately. Yeah, I'm curious, what will the average climber, somebody who's listening right now, what will they learn? What's the area of focus for you in this course and kind of what's the journey going to be like for them? Mm. So don't expect so much about like how you should train, how many bouldering sessions, how many lead climbing sessions you should do, but it's more about concepts of how you will be able to climb at your best and what mm. are the aspects that you have to think about and work on. They are no like easy advices that you will follow and you will get there. It will include your active engagement and involvement on your path to become a better climber. But for some people that might be a bad news, but I, I really see it as a positive news that there's so many things that you need to learn as a climber that will still help you to get better and better. And it's not, and it's so much fun. It's never ever monotonous in my opinion. You can, you could, you can make your training monotonous, but I don't believe it will be the most efficient way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's so well laid out. The chapters are really extensive and deep and the production quality is incredibly high. So I think it's really an exciting thing that you all are doing. But I need to know, Adam, should I hang for seven seconds or should I hang for 10 seconds? That's what I need to know. <laughs> exactly. Those are the things that I think a lot of the people are seeking now, but there is no general truth, you know? For right. person number, for person A, it will be seven seconds. And for person B, it will be 10 seconds. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm, I'm excited for what you all are doing with that. Um, beyond the course, you've got a, a lot of, a lot going on with gyms, holds, YouTube, um, you know, the content that you're putting out, books, it's all a lot, right? I'm sure it's quite a bit of work. Uh, I've got a lot of questions from listeners who wonder how you strike that balance in your life between training, climbing, doing these other businesses, and then also just like relaxing and okay. being with the family and that kind of thing and, and what you do for fun. How, how does that kind of balance out for you from week to week? Mm, so I would say for the last two or three years, I think I found this, the balance. And even though there's a lot of work, I also have an incredible team of colleagues that are doing a lot of work for me. So in the last two or three years, I feel like I've reached this right balance that I have time for my family, especially as I now have a son that will be two years in May. So that is getting like super important or that has been super important that I didn't want to tra uh, work more than I wanted that I didn't want to also maybe like travel, travel for climbing more than I wanted, but it's been going well as I was during the last two years, mostly just preparing for the competitions. And after the next Olympics, I'll be probably just traveling with the whole family and maybe even working less. But I think up to a certain point, I think I need a certain distraction. So I don't think about climbing 24 seven, even though my work is always some kind of con somehow connected with climbing and yeah. For example, working on the course for the altitude, but as I think there are many videos that I find a lot of gratitude for making that they are not just pure entertainment, but they have a certain value. I don't know if it's like showing a historical route and like giving, you know, enough attention to the first ascension is that they deserve that. That makes me feel like pretty happy about what we do. I really like how much you've embraced the history of climbing. You just recently did a great interview with Chris Hampton um, about just do it. And, you know, yeah, to, to your point, kind of this um, attention to the first ascensionist and, and how it's done. I'm curious, as you look at historical climbs versus new climbs, what your opinion is on the grading of those? Let's talk about grades for a second. Everybody loves to talk about grades. Uh, it depends, depends so much on the style. 
So from the modern point of view, all like the vertical, really techy climbs, they would usually feel sandbagged, but mm. those few climbs that are steep, like from the eighties, nineties, they don't feel sandbagged at all. So, but I think that's almost also because, I don't know, imagine being a rock climber in the eighties, all that, almost all the routes were vertical. So most of the climbing that you were doing was vertical. So you were obviously really good in vertical climbing. But steep climbing, the climbing gyms didn't exist. So how should you train for them? So right. I think from the modern point of view, it would make sense to maybe reflect this and put it into the consideration and into the grading. That means maybe some of the historical climbs that are more vertical and feels really hard, maybe upgrade. Um, and I think then it would mostly equal out. I, I can't really think of like super tough route for the grade, which is really steep and which is from the 80s, 90s. They are usually the same. Maybe Hubble. Depend, like, I think that that is more, in Hubble it's really complicated because there was like a shift in grading scale. Like, so Ben Moon gave it 8C+. And I think in the perspective of the HCs back then, like etching court in Bukes, yeah, then in that case, Hubble is an HC plus. But then Wolfgang Gilly established Action Direct and he didn't grade it at 9A, but he graded it at 11 in UIAA grading system scale. But back right. then there was no great grading conversion. Later on, the grading conversion of Action Direct instead of HC plus got into 9A which made the Hubble as an 80 plus really send back. But I think yeah. if you look at, if you think of, I think now as it is, there is less of a difference between 80 and 80 plus and 80 plus 9A than it should be. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, compressed. You got, it's, people think that the grading is not linear. I think it is. It is just getting subjectively harder and harder to improve, which is obvious, you know, if you're a hundred meter sprinter, it's really easy to improve from 10 seconds to 9.5, but it's almost impossible to improve from four seconds to 3.5. It's right. the same in climbing. But in particular, the difference between AC and AC plus and AC plus 9A is maybe not as big as it should be. And I think it's more mostly because this mess in the 80s in for conversion between UIAA and French grade. Well, I, I think that's a perspective that I haven't heard. So thank you. I really appreciate, I think, how thoughtful that analysis is of those highest grades at the time. What about this kind of modern introduction of gear and techniques, maybe most notably like knee pads, gripping knee pads and knee bars, something that you're incredibly skilled at and obviously takes skill because I cannot hold a knee bar, you know, for the life of me. But if a first ascensionist put up a route in a grade not employing that gear or that technique, should it be repeated in that manner or should the grade change if there's a significant rest that's found, for example, by using a knee pad when one didn't exist 20 years ago? It depends. I think if you climb it with a knee pad and it feels much easier, you should go for a different grade. But in general, I don't think there should be a double grade knee pad or no knee pad. Because in most of the cases, you can still do a knee bar with no knee pad. But in general, in limestone, it's just not fun. It's horrible. Right. So for example, I climbed for most of my life without knee pads. Yes, 15 years ago, I was definitely not as good knee bar climber as I am today. But I was pretty good and I was placing a lot of knee bars. And I was either climbing with jeans or I was climbing with short pants and I would spend like weeks before making a trip to like Tufa limestone, like sandpapering my, my thighs and like really taking the best care that I could to have like a good skin. And then trying a project, all I was thinking about hanging in a knee bar, like should I really go for it and like bruise my skin on the thighs in until I'm bleeding and risking that if I fall off, I might not be able to knee bar for another week hmm. or should I maybe like just stay a little bit, save my skin for the next try. It was horrible. 
The guy hated it. The interaction of knee pads is great because every single try, you can go for it and you don't have to think about it. But attention, it's the same like climbing crags with gloves or not. If you spend two months in Rodear knee barring every single day, you're, you develop a callus on the thigh. And then you can almost knee bar online on Tufas as good as with the knee pads. Wow. So, so the on, in, on Limestone, for me, the debate between knee pad or no knee pad doesn't really make so much sense because then is it with callus or no callus? Like, how do... Right. Are calluses need? And those are the topics that nobody really discuss. That's the, that's a big problem because then the question would be more like, do you, do you just on purpose skip that knee bar or not? But it's the same question. Do you on purpose skip this heel look or not? Right. So everybody finds like skipping a heel look if it's there, finds it ridiculous. But in case of knee bar, it's the same. There are yeah. other cases like the knee bar in Hubble, for example. That is very technical knee bar. And if you don't have the rubber on your knee, you don't take any advantage about it. Mm -hmm. So there, two grades make sense. But it's quite rare. Like Flatanger or some of the sandstone climbing areas where it's more like knee scums. Yes, there are many knee bars that just basically don't work with without a knee pad. But on most of the limestone where we are talking about knee barring on too fast, it's more of a question of pain. We'll let the debate continue, but yeah. I think your perspective yeah. on that is, is really valuable because obviously you put up a lot of routes where there are technical knee bars. And if you use a pad, then that's how the route is established. So it's more kind of on the historical perspective, like yeah. Hubble, like you're talking about, or others where maybe the first ascensionist didn't use or have access to that equipment and i don't know if it matters at all but just people love talking about it yeah, so my, my perspective is like okay if you find a knee bar and you climb it with a knee pad yeah just downgraded congratulations on your career i'm really excited for this altitude course and um, just grateful for your time today to to share the stoke with the community and, and give back in the ways that, that you have you've just been as many of the listeners wrote in you've been such an ambassador and you've you've held such kind of the spirit of climbing for the climbing community for decades now. Thank you, Adam. This has been a real pleasure. You're welcome. Great chat. Oh man, talk about a masterclass with just one of the greatest climbers to ever tie in. I hope you guys love this conversation as much as I did. And as impressive as Adam is as a climber, which is pretty dang impressive, it was just so cool to see how down to earth he is as a person. He knows his stuff. He knows how to communicate it. I mean, what a dream would it be to have this guy as your climbing coach? Well, guess what? Now you can. As we've talked about in this show, Adam's sport climbing course with Altitude Climbing is just about to launch. You can learn more and join the waitlist over at myclimbingcourse.com. I've previewed the content, you guys, and it is incredibly well done. It's very in-depth. I'm talking about 40 lessons across eight modules, 10 hours or so of course material here with Adam in the gym and out at the crag, and it's geared towards intermediate to advanced climbers and how to get better without having to get stronger. He's just the most stoked guy that I've ever seen when it comes to digging into the nuances of climbing. Just the joy on his face as he was talking about all this stuff today with me was so contagious. And by the way, if you want to see the joy on his face from this conversation yourself, the uncut video of this conversation, plus the full bonus episode with Adam, is available right now over on Patreon. So what's in this bonus episode that I keep mentioning? Oh man, it's so much good stuff, you guys. Adam answers patron questions, which is always fun. He shares his perspective on the quote-unquote rivalry between himself and Alex Magos. So if you like tea, there it is. He shares his thoughts on the best routes in the world and also takes a passionate position on chipping holds and what he feels about all of that. He talks about system boards versus spray walls, the recent trend of downgrading, who would win in a fight between himself, Jakob, and Stefano, 
And he also does a full video breakdown of his groundbreaking ascent of silence. It's all over there and so much more, like 40 hours more of bonus content at patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show. Or if you're an Apple person, you can subscribe right there in your podcast player. Both of those have free trials going on right now. So you can check it all out for free. If you like it, stick around. Thank you. Love your support. And if you don't, you can just bail. Now you can follow Adam on IG at Adam.Andra and his YouTube channel at AdamAndra. And you can follow along with me on IG and YouTube at The Struggle Climbing Show. And I've also got a newsletter that I send out that's got some pretty banger content in it, some behind the scenes stuff, including stuff with Adam Andra. It's not spammy, I promise. And you can sign up for that over at thestruggleclimbingshow.com. Huge thanks and appreciation to our show sponsors who have brought you this episode at zero cost. I'm talking about Fizzy Vantage, Crimped, and Force Board. Y'all are so, so awesome. Check your show notes for links and special discounts from those guys that are only available to Struggle listeners. And also you can see all of the show's brand sponsors and special deals by just popping over to thestruggleclimbingshow.com slash deals. The Struggle is carbon neutral in partnership with the Honnold Foundation. Awesome. This episode was produced and hosted by me, Ryan Devlin, and The Struggle is a proud member of the Plug Tone Audio Collective, a diverse group of the best, most impactful podcasts in the outdoor industry. I hope your training and climbing are going great. Have an awesome day, and I will see you soon. So look, you're like the master of the flash attempt here. So you should be quite adept at this. Decide and then just move on. Rapid fire questions here. Mm -hmm. Finger strength or flexibility? Choose one. Both. System board or spray wall? Spray wall. Power or endurance? Endurance. Speed or ability to rest on route? Speed. Physical strength or mental strength? Mental strength. On-site or red point? On-site. Boulder or sport? Sport. La Dura Dura or silence? Silence. Donuts or ice cream? Ice cream. <laughs> you flashed it. Well, dude, thank you so much. What a joy to meet you and have an awesome day. Bye.